beginning with uh, YouTube. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great uh, for you all to join us this evening. Uh, we have a really interesting discussion and uh, topic. It's uh, for our Wilson LGBTIQ History Month, and uh, we have Dr. Clara Barker here. I'm going to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Clara Barker is a thin film materialist, uh, material scientist who manages the Center for Applied Superconductivity in the Materials Department at Oxford University. Uh, she is also the chair of the LGBT plus advisory group uh, at Oxford University and the Dean for Equality and Diversity at Lineker College, as well as a member of the Royal Society's Equality and Diversity Committee. In 2018, she won the first VC's Diversity Role Model Award from the university. She runs a youth group as well for LGBTI plus young people and is a school role model for Stonewall, Stonewall School role model. Uh, she's presented a talk at a TEDx uh, Women London event in 2018 and her volunteer work uh, has won a Points of Light Award from the UK Prime Minister in 2017. So very distinguished uh, scientist as well as uh, activist in LGBTQI uh, STEM field. Uh, welcome, Dr. Clara Barker. We're very, very pleased to have you here and you. excited to hear more from you about this topic. That was a good start. I almost kicked my cup of tea over. So <laughs> I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, let's make sure I've got the right one. That one. It's always the fun bit, making sure we get the right screen. Okay, yes. excellent. That should be the one. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I don't really need to go over any of these titles then in that case, which is nice. <laughs> so I'll move on to my title slide now. What I'm going to do, and you didn't realize I was going to do this, but, you know, I am... Um, a uh, LGBTI plus person, I'm a trans person, uh, but I am a scientist. So I will just very, very briefly uh, go over what it is that I do. And I'm talking about very briefly and very basic. So a lot of people don't really know what material science is. If we take a little bit of chemistry, we take a little bit of engineering and we take a little bit of physics, we're at the intersection. We're a hybrid science um, in material science. So we have aspects of all of those different subjects. And in fact, I've often worked in engineering departments, chemistry departments and physics departments as a material scientist. So we're in the middle somewhere. We're a hybrid. And just uh, like I say, very briefly what it is we're trying to do. Uh, imagine carbon. So I think we're all familiar with carbon. We have all these different atoms. But we know that depending on how we arrange those carbon atoms, we actually have very different materials. So you've got graphite, which is very uh, soft. It's a, a dark colored material. Uh, and we've got diamond, which is a very hard material and transparent. And they have very different material uh, properties. And that's we still got the same carbon atoms. It's just how we arrange them. It's just the bonds between them, what sort of structure we have. And so as material scientists, we're basically trying to play with the bonds between materials. Um, and indeed, I have made diamond-like carbon. So yeah, we're basically playing with the bonds between materials, just seeing what we can do and trying to develop new materials that we can use, whether it's a coating on our glasses to stop them getting scratched, uh, the touch screens on our phones, there's all sorts of applications that you wouldn't have thought about. My first job was actually putting the metal on the inside of crisp packets to keep them fresh. So there you go. Um, and it also means that I get to work with these really cool plasma uh, glows. I'm a, uh, I do thin film deposition. So I use a type of system called magnetron sputtering. And depending on which gas and which metal I'm using, it gives you a different colored glow, which is really pretty cool. Uh, in my opinion, and I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. But I'm actually here to talk about equality and diversity and, and trying to improve equity in STEM, really. And I want to just sort of show that so often we hear that um, if you want to do well in science, just be yourself, just get on with it, just do the work, do the hard work. 
But actually, we're starting to recognize that there are actually barriers that mean that we can't just do our job, that there are actually certain things that are stopping us and preventing us from being able to do that. Um, and so, of course, the first thing that we need to do is acknowledge there's a problem. And we're starting to see this sort of data come out. So, you know, but let's look at some things. So um, in the UK, there are around 20,000 professors, 15,000 of them are men and 5,000 of them are women. So if we're talking binary genders, there's already a discrepancy there. If we're talking um, black men in the UK, uh, we're talking 90 professors are men, 25 uh, black women are professors in the UK. And the last um, census um, said that black British people in the UK make up around 30% of our population. So there's a big disparity there. I think there's, you can agree that, um, what is it, 115 uh, black people in the UK is not 13% of the population. Of that, uh, let's look at the percentage of academics that are professors. So uh, of uh, white academics in the UK, over 11% are professors but only 4.6% of those academics are professors uh, who are black. So again, these are sort of looking at the numbers within themselves, there's a disparity there. Looking at disability, um, the number of professors in the UK that disclose they have a disability is 3%, and yet, uh, yet 22% of the population in the UK from the census. So again, another discrepancy. Looking at gender, and here I'm going to be talking about uh, binary gender, so male and female. I'm also not, so I'm not going to talk about non-binary in these numbers, and I'm also not going to talk about intersex people either. Um, but the UKRI, a large science funding body, last year looked at who are we giving the money to, and so what they saw is that men are more likely to go for the big uh, funding and bids, uh, funding grants. In, from the UKRI, uh, so men are more likely to go for them. But also it showed that of uh, those that actually do apply, men have a much higher chance of getting those larger grants as well. So that sort of suggests that there's some sort of balance there, uh, gender imbalance there. Uh, and again, we can look at things like, you know, taking it financially um, of the male academics in the UK, around 36% earn over 50,000 pounds per year, whereas that is only uh, around the 22% mark for female academics in the UK. So again, uh, you know, even though there's more men than women, when we're looking at percentages of those numbers, they should be even, but something is happening here, something, there's some sort of inequality here. So talking about LGBTI plus specifics, um, and I do apologize, but some of these slides over the coming, oh, some of these next slides are uh, a little difficult, some of the early statistics. Um, but there's, um, so there's a cartoon on screen, um, which is from the wonderful Assigned Male uh, comics, uh, the uh, artist Sophie LaBelle. Um, in the past, I, uh, we used to talk about um, being LGBT as being a mental illness. Uh, there's this glorious uh, case that in Sweden in the 70s, uh, an awful lot of people, because being homosexual was a mental illness, a whole bunch of people rang in sick and said, I can't come into work today, I'm gay. Uh, and obviously this prompted people to go, hang on a second, okay, maybe it isn't an illness. And indeed the World Health Organization doesn't count being LGBT as a, a mental illness. However, the LGBTI plus community does have heightened um, uh, issues when it comes to mental health. Uh, there are elevated numbers of uh, suicide for LGBTI plus people, which are particularly high in the trans community. And sadly, we see really similar numbers mirrored when it comes to young people as well. What I would say, you do get people that will argue the numbers uh, and argue over how valid they are. But we actually see very, very similar numbers coming up time and time again in different reports. So even if the precise numbers aren't correct, the trends are definitely uh, uh, meaningful and significant. And 
I'm also going to go back, you know, to the very beginning, because if we want to look at inequality in science for LGBTI plus people, we've also got to realize that these are people who have been through the school system. So uh, looking at life in UK schools, 45% uh, of LGBTI plus young people are bullied in school. That goes up to two thirds if you just look at the trans pupils. And indeed, one in 10 trans pupils receive death threats in school. Again, you can argue the specific percentages, but we see similar trends come up time and time again. Um, and actually, young people don't even necessarily feel safe at home. Uh, there was a report by the Albert Kennedy Trust that showed that of the uh, young homeless in the UK, 25% are LGBTI+. Plus, and of those, 8% said that the main reason that they were homeless was because they were LGBTI+. Plus. So we can't guarantee that young people feel safe at home and they don't feel safe at school. And the result of this is that we're losing people in the pipeline from a really early age. Um, now, we don't have data for LGBTI plus people dropping out of schools, although I work with young people and I know that their aspiration is to finish and get out rather than to do well. You know, there's not that impetus to do well. Um but we do have data from America, um, and it actually shows that a third of young LGBTI people drop out of school, which is three times the national rate. And the main reason is feeling unsafe, bullying. And actually, there are surveys that have shown that LGBTI plus young people uh, just basically fare worse on all measures of academic achievement. That isn't academic ability. That's academic achievement. And of course, if we start looking at the intersections, um, and especially if we look at race, I've put up another graph, but actually there's more data in this report that shows, shows if you're LGBTI plus and uh, black, for instance, in the United States, the numbers get even worse. So again, we're seeing similar numbers. And it's interesting that, you know, we're saying a third of young people in America are dropping out and we're seeing a third of young people, people in the UK or half of young people in the UK are be, being bullied. And we've even seen similar sort of data from uh, uh, from India as well. You know, uh, actually, there was a, a survey that was done a few years ago, and it showed that of LGBTI plus young people, uh, a third of LGBTI plus people were dropping out of school. These numbers are remarkably similar. And these are just in the countries where it's where, you know, we're not even looking at countries where it's actually illegal or, you know, there's a government uh, push to reduce the LGBTI plus population. Uh, and so we have to remember that, you know, there's an impact. These are young people who aren't, who, for all we know, they could be fantastic scientists if they were given that support, if they felt they were able to be themselves at school and at home, uh, but we're actually losing them further down the line. Um, and we can argue statistics all we want, but time and time again, we see personal quotes. Uh, there's one, you know, I had the choice of the girl's bathroom, which was my legal sex, or the nurse's bathroom. I was suspended from school for using the boy's bathroom. Uh, school is such a toxic environment that I couldn't force myself to go for almost a month or two. And now if I miss any more, I'm going to fail high school. So, you know, these are personal stories. Um, there are real people on the end of these statistics. Does it get better once we get to university? So we often hear how universities are bubbles of, you know, uh, snowflakes where you can, you know, everyone, it's a perfectly safe space and we can all be ourselves. Well, the Oxford SU did a report last year on uh, trans people here in Oxford and found that two in three trans students actually experience harassment or discrimination. 30% of that was from academic staff. The rest was from other students or um, administrative staff. Only 17% had reported that, and only one in five felt comfortable reporting that. So somewhere along the lines, people don't want to report it. So the numbers that we're seeing officially aren't as high as they should be because most people aren't reporting these uh, crimes. And we see a similar thing in the UK with LGBTI plus hate crimes, that the police numbers don't match those that we see from uh, charities that work with LGBTI plus people, there's a difference, there's a disparity in the numbers. And it also suggests that there's something that, the truth is that, you know, a lot of students 
uh, know that their supervisor, their academic lecturer or whatever can can have a big sway on their future career. So maybe they don't want to report it for fear of retaliation. And I hear things from this from students around the country. And so, of course, this means that, you know, um, we're losing sort of LGBTI plus people before we get to the academic stage, uh, shall we say, the, the postgraduate stage rather. And then once we get there, we're also having further uh, losses. So uh, these numbers are a little bit, um, they're not out of date, but there are newer ones that have just been released. So I haven't been able to incorporate them yet. Uh, but, you know, there was a report done in America that uh, showed that there's less than 6% of LGBTI plus people in STEM are out. And that actually one in three physicists, for instance, have been advised to remain in the closet. Now, of course, this depends on the field. It depends on the subject. But it's interesting that we're seeing that people are being told if you come out, that's going to negatively impact your career. Uh, and these are from America, but there was actually... Um, a report done that was released two years ago now. I have to remember that we're in 2021, not in 2020 anymore. Uh, it's difficult when we've not left the house much in that time. Um, but there was a report by the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Institute of Physics and the Royal Astronomical Society. I'm sorry, I'm a scientist, so a lot of these numbers do have a scientific twang, but hopefully they translate. Uh, and what they showed was that LGBTI plus people in the physical sciences uh, experience exclusionary behavior in academia. They experience intimidating or harassment in um, in the physical sciences, and women experience that higher than at a higher rate than men. And of non-binary people, we do have non-binary data here, experienced it higher than men or women. And uh, probably related to that, 30% of trans uh, respondents had experienced sort of uh, exclusionary or harassment behavior uh, compared to non-trans people, so much higher rates. And this means that we've got more people sort of leaving uh, science. We've got more people leaving academia, more people leaving STEM. Again, this is STEM focus because um, that's my field. <laughs> Um, but what we have is data that showed that, you know, nearly 30 percent of respondents who are LGBT consider leaving uh, uh, academia sometimes. And that's compared to 16 percent for non-LGBTI plus respondents. And it actually goes up to 20 percent. Uh, so it's 20 percent of trans respondents actually consider leaving often. So this isn't sometimes this is often. Um, and these numbers mean a lot to me because I was in those the, that group. Um, so I did my undergraduate, I did my PhD, I was working as a postdoc, and I had fel visiting uh, research posts in various places around Europe. But I thought that once I left, uh, once I transitioned, once I started trying to look after my mental health effectively, I thought that my scientific career was over because in 15 years, I met two out gay people, no trans people. And I worked around the world. I was working in labs on collaborations around the world. I was, I was talking at conferences around the world. So to see just two out gay people in all that time and no trans representation, that suggested to me that I could not be a trans scientist. Simple as. So Towards the end of my postdocs, I wasn't necessarily concentrating as much as I should have been on my, um, you know, on writing up my experiments. I certainly wasn't writing fellowships because I knew I was going to transition. What's the point? And I'd actually um, signed up to do a conversion course in a completely different field, completely, you know, not science, basically, because I didn't think I could be a scientist and be trans. So we're losing people. And there's a whole bunch of stats on, uh, you know, the losses that we face in STEM, for instance, uh, and academia of people of different uh, sort of, of different groups. So, we, you know, we find papers that show we're more likely to lose LGBTI plus people from STEM careers, BME people from uh, STEM careers, people with disabilities. Women only make up 23% of people in STEM and 50% of the population. And we do see similar sort of things in academia, but of course it is very uh, field dependent. And even within 
uh, you know, this 23% of women in STEM, engineering is a lot lower, whereas certain subjects are a lot higher. So I just started doing my thing. I, uh, I came to Oxford. I only came to Oxford to prove that it was going to be a horrible experience, that I was going to face discrimination. I had no um, belief that I was going to get offered the job that I applied for. I was surprised when I was given an interview. And when I came, I just assumed that I was going to be treated um, horribly, to be perfectly honest. But I came anyway, because as a scientist, of course, we all want to prove things. We don't just want to assume. Um, and lo and behold, like I got to Oxford and I did the interview and they were really, they were asking about my qualifications, my expertise. They were asking job relevant questions. Now, I know from friends that that doesn't always happen. But yeah, I was being asked about how suitable I was for the job based on my technical skills. And well, I was really surprised. I was so surprised when I got offered the job that I, um, they thought I was haggling. And so, you know, offered me more money because they honestly, I was so surprised. They just assumed I was haggling. So I started sharing my experience and I started talking about this. And once I come out to people that I used to work with, it turns out that a lot of that was assumed because of the climate I saw around me, the lack of visible role models. And so I realized that, you know, I, somebody needs to start talking somebody needs to start being seen and the number of times over the last few years where I've done a talk and someone's come up to me and said I was going to leave STEM I was going to leave academia um, that I've never seen a trans person give a talk before uh, it happens more than you'd think so so now I just don't shut up really I talk everywhere that I can um, and I kind of enjoy it um, and it has its weird perks as well. Um, so, <clears throat> so I've 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 discussed that you know we have people leaving STEM, and we know that we have people leaving STEM, and it's very worth noting at this point that the statistics we have for the people that were going to leave STEM, are going to leave academia, they're all the ones that were resilient, the ones that put up with that racism, put up with that sexism, and stayed in the field. We don't know how many people we've actually lost at the stages before that, as we showed schools, universities, we're losing people all along the way. So actually, when we look at diversity data, we're looking at the survivors. We're looking at the ones who have been able to, well, yeah, who have been resilient, basically. And so, of course, we'll see people saying, well, there's no such thing as racism in science. There's no such thing as sexism, you know. We have academics who very openly will uh, give talks and say that, you know, women cannot do science. We have people that strongly believe that are willing to publish this in national press and, you know, we'll invite them along to Oxford University to give talks. Um, and then there's also, you know, so they had the obvious sort of uh, sexism, racism, homophobia, but then we also have other things happening. So. Uh, last year, the Institute of Physics, they named their new fellows and there were more white men named Brian than there were women and BME people. Um, so, and I work with the Institute of Physics a lot. So, uh, in fact, I just agreed to chair a panel next week for them this afternoon. I work with them an awful lot, but these sort of things send messages. So it's, a ma it's about making sure that we embed um, our equality and diversity and we're not just talking about it and we're thinking about it at all stages because this sort of thing sends a message um i will just say a little bit that i used to naively say that um, equality wasn't cake that there was plenty to go around uh, but what i have realized is that um, if you have uh, disadvantaged groups uh, who are applying for funding and more advantaged groups shall i say uh, that are applying for funding. The truth is we know that certain groups are more likely to get that funding than others. I talked about gender before, and there's actually a very similar report coming out about uh, uh, BAME uh, should be in the next month or two. So of course, if there's certain groups that are more likely to get funding, other groups are less likely to get funding. So what we want to do is make sure those underrepresented groups have a higher chance of getting the funding that they apply for. But of course, if we do that, then we have to, br then the people who, currently have more chance of getting that funding well that odds all of a sudden go down they have more uh competition let's be honest and so 
there's some people who have no interest in um, allowing equity because all of a sudden they're going to have more competition for those research grants, which we all know are precious. <laughs> um, but why would we why would we care about diversity? So I will say that the banking and financial uh, sectors have been looking into this for a while, and they've put out various reports. And what we see is that. Uh, actually, if you look at diversity, and in this case, we're talking uh, binary genders and race, but what they've seen is that their more diverse groups are actually making more money. So if you see um, a banking institute sort of funding um, like uh, Black History Month or um, LGBT Pride, it, it's not because they're an amazing company, maybe they are, but they also know that it's profitable for them to treat everyone equally, like they actually have a vested interest in this. So if we need the carrot, there we go. Um, and we don't necessarily have the same data in STEM at the moment, but we are starting to see reports that, again, maybe uh, we need to do a lot more research, but it suggests there are reports that suggest that more diverse groups are actually getting cited more often with their papers. So that makes the impression, you know, that they're doing better science. So I'd say that academically, we do have a good reason to want to uh, have better equity, better diversity. Now, there's certain things that we can look at and certain things that we can do. And this is by no means exhaustive, but a couple of little things that we can think about. Uh, bathroom distribution. So, well, first of all, it'd be great if all bathrooms were uh, gender neutral because then we'd never have to worry about it. But just looking at uh, the number of engineering departments I have walked around and they, on their open day, say, we really don't understand why there's not more women in science. And yet they have the women's bathroom on every third floor. Um, and the men's are on every floor. Well, that sort of thing sends a message. You know, departments might say, oh, we're really accessible. We welcome everyone with disabilities. But then someone in a wheelchair turns up or someone that um, for some reason is on crutches. And what they say is, well, it's a door. It's around the back of the building. And if it's raining, there's no shelter. And sometimes it doesn't work. Also, does our institute, you know, have a paid transcription service, live transcription, because there are hard of hearing people out there. Who's doing your tours and interviews? It's all well and good if you do a video telling students to come to our department and do research. And it's uh, this wonderful array of diverse people, but then all the people that are doing the tours kind of look the same, you know, um, maybe they're all straight white men, maybe. Uh, you know, you can have all the videos you want, but these are the people that people are interacting with, that are potential students. Who are you promoting? Who are your role models? Are you talking about certain days and months, Mental Health Awareness Day, uh, Black History Month, things like that? There's something to be said. We don't need to go overboard in departments, in, in different groups. We don't need to sort of be waving a flag every five minutes. But it says a lot if there's at least something in you know the department newsletter that just marks like, hey, it's uh, Mental Health Awareness Day coming up. That says a lot. Um, academically, if we've got a conference, is it a diverse panel? And by diverse, I don't mean, well, there was a couple of women on the panel. Um you know, we need to make sure that we do have diverse panels. It's possible to do it. Um, so make sure that your panel are comfortable. Pay your speakers as well. You know, if you're especially if you're doing them for sort of outreach or whatever diversity work, it comes with a lot of emotional labor. And unfortunately, as institutions, we don't really count that towards, you know, funding applications or whatever. So, um, you know, we should be looking after our people that are doing that and uh, showing that we appreciate them. Who are you naming your buildings after? Look, it's not about cancelling people. We can't help it if there is someone in the past who made a fantastic discovery but also happened to be a massive racist or a slaver or uh, homophobic. We can't change that they made that discovery, but are they really the right person to be naming prizes after? Why can't we find better role models to be naming our buildings and prizes afterward, after? Yes, we still need to talk about that person and the contributions we made, but let's treat it as that it was a contribution and then celebrate those that have um you know have had a good impact on the field uh, in all ways 
and who has a real voice, who's actually being listened to at the highest levels. So it's great. Even in STEM, we're starting to see more and more uh, LGBT awareness. There's pride in STEM in the UK. There's the LGBTQ plus STEM in our conference, which was run in January this year in Oxford. I've still not recovered. Uh, in case you're wondering, we have LGBT STEM Day as well. And it's great to see uh, learning societies actually sort of paying attention to uh, uh, LGBT um, inclusion and representation and starting to talk about this on a regular basis. And indeed, the Royal Society of Chemistry just did a fantastic toolkit that they released at the end of last year, on uh, which it's an LGBT cool toolkit by the Royal Society of Chemistry, but it applies to anyone in academia and schools. But even better, let's start looking intersectionally. The Inclusion Group for Equity in Research in STEM, or the Tigers, you know, they're a group of people who are looking at all diversities, working together. We have conversations. People keep on saying you can't talk about gender uh, identity in a calm manner. Well, actually, you can, as long as everyone is respectful of each other and actually listens. And the Tigers have really shown that. And for those that say, well, you can't have a, a series of webinars which are completely diverse. Again, we held a physics um, webinar series last summer and we're doing a chemistry one this year. It is possible. You've just got to put the effort and the time in. Um, just a couple of great things that I can see, like, so um, there's a, a fantastic race equality uh, campaigner, Chris Jackson, um, and he actually campaigned to make sure that his geoscience students uh, didn't have to go to a country where it was illegal or where it was not safe to be LGBT. You know, it's all well and good, but if this is compulsory field work, there are a lot of countries it's not safe for me to go. And indeed, it's the same with conferences. Is it in a conference where I'm allowed to be? You know, if it's in Dubai, it's illegal to, for me to exist, pretty much. Um, and it's great to see the American Physical Society looking at data in America on police brutality when they're choosing their state, because we know that certain races are disproportionately affected by violence from the police. So um, it's all about, it's not about who you're excluding. It's about who you're uh, sending signals to and inviting into your conference. Um, I'm just going to finish on a realist sort of, <laughs> this is my, one of those little stories where we look at fusion energy. So fusion energy is a potential means of supplying our energy needs for the future because we know that we need new ways. So fingers crossed we can get fusion energy to work and not just because they use an awful lot of superconductors, which I work with, uh, but it's actually got the potential to really help us going forward. So far, JET has the world record for 24 uh, megawatts put in. We got 16 megawatts out. Obviously, if we want to use it as energy creation for the planet, we kind of need to get more out than we get in. So we're not quite there yet. The longest plasma uh, was in China in East, uh, and that was a 10 second plasma. So also not ideal so far. ITER is our latest uh, fusion generator. It's just started being built, should be done by 2024-ish. We should be able to have fusion power by 2035 and then results by 2040. So we're looking long-term for this. We're looking to the future for to look for solutions for our energy. Uh, ITER costs around 20 billion. It's an international project and it might not work. We have no idea whether we'll actually be able to get uh, the you know fusion generation uh, energy working in order to be able to fund uh, to fuel the population, but it's worth trying. And we put so much money and effort and time into that. I never understand why people say that we shouldn't be doing the same with our academics, with our students. If we're going to put all that effort into our energy mean resources, then we should do the same with our people. And who knows? We've seen how many people, how often down the pipeline we lose people in academia because of prejudice. How do we not? How do we know that we haven't already lost the person that might have come up with the solution and already solved fusion energy? We have no idea. Um, yeah, so with that, my final slide. Uh, this is a pink plastic recorder, which is found in the Bait Collection in Oxford. Uh, the Bait Collection is a collection of beautiful wooden wind instruments. And in the middle of it is this pink plastic recorder. 
And people often ask, why do you have this in the display case alongside these really expensive, uh, beautiful wooden wind instruments? And the reason is that in blind tests, people can't tell the difference in the sound. So the thing that really matters, no one can tell the difference. And yet it's treated differently because of how it looks on the surface. And I think that's a, an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. Thank you. This was really, really interesting. Uh, so much uh, stuff that you've covered, uh, ranging all the way from early education to university. And I think uh, I, from my side, I want to also say thank you for you being one of the resilient uh, uh, people who have gone through a lot uh, in this process. And uh, you've been a scientist and uh, questioned the hypotheses uh, and assumptions that you had about uh, your opportunities. And uh, I'm really glad that you did that. Thank you. Uh, so for everyone uh, here uh, who's joined us, I want to welcome any questions uh, that you have. Uh, it would be really nice if you can uh, send the questions in the chat and I'll read them out for Clara and uh, we will have a discussion. There's also a YouTube uh, feed uh, live right now and we will get some questions there as well. We have some moderators, we have some people who can convey those questions uh, here in Zoom for us. Uh, so to begin with, I'll just uh, start with one question that I had and then I'll, uh, I have a couple of questions already so I'll read them out for you. Uh, so I, I was thinking a lot about while you were speaking about all of the different challenges that people face in their education all the way to uh, university. And within that context, you've raised a lot of different things from bullying to you know, harassment in, uh, and culture and all of those things. Recently, there's been so much discussion, so much uh, political discourse, especially in the UK around gender identity and uh, trans uh, rights. Uh, I'm wondering how does that whole debate uh, and the kind of discourse in the media as well as in academia, uh, how does that impact scientists specifically uh, around, in your experience, uh, not just uh, trans scientists, but other like BME and other minorities as well. Uh, those kind of debates in your experience, have they played a role in scientific kind of like work and how departments recruit and how departments actually deal with these issues? If you could speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, so what's been great over the last few years is that universities, learned societies, they're all um, putting more, because they understand the, um, you know, the benefits of, of having a better society, a more equitable society. What we're seeing is that they're actually putting quite a lot of effort into improving their, you know, their diversity, improving their policies and guidelines. But it is a little sad that if you do so, um, there are an, an awful, there's a, a vocal minority of people who will hound people for having done just that, who will um, inundate them with, oh, excuse me, comments on social media. They will um, maybe be sending freedom of information requests to universities and uh, about particular academics in, uh, uh, academics in particular. Believe it or not, we've actually got some people that are trying to disrupt actual research which is going on um, in universities uh, on for people that are trying to sort of look into how best to support transgender young people. Um, it's a little bit concerning as well. So um, there's often the talk of freedom of speech, but I think anyone that actually works in a university knows that there's an awful lot of discussions go on. Uh, there is a lot of that conversation happening um, and it's making sure that it's respectful and it's almost, but we do still have to remember that these are people, we've still got students, we've still got staff members and there's a, there's a difference between discussing why trans people exist or how to best um, support them. There's a difference between that and just questioning whether we really exist at all when we're in the room saying, yes, we, we exist. Um, and the education minister in the UK last week, uh, you know, basically commended someone who said that uh, gay people were an abomination in a class and were uh, dismissed from the university for saying that. 
the education minister last week said that he should be praised for being an advocate of free speech. Now, if we had the same thing, if we were talking about race, if we were talking about certain religions, would you, you know, if you were saying openly racist things in class, would you be commended in the same way? And so the debate for a long time has been, you know, it's been pushed towards trans people and whether being trans is, you know, really a, a real thing or whether it's acceptable and whether we're going to endanger everyone. But it's interesting to see that um, there are moves now to widen that out. And it's it's no longer just people going after the trans community. It's going after the LGBTI plus community a little bit more widely. And it's there's that comment, isn't there, that, you know, if you come, we come for one group, we come for another group and who's ne- who's left, who's next. And so this is why it's so important that we start looking at diversity intersectionally, all working towards, um, you know, whether it's race, whether it's disability, whether it's mental health, gender. Um, we need to start looking at these things together and as a group because we are more powerful and we can make change um, easier if we're united. And rather than looking at the extreme data, it's so easy. We know as scientists, you look at uh, an extreme piece of data and to a certain degree, you mitigate it. You'll take it out of the, of the graph, you know, or you'll do a mean or an average or something. Um, and yet when it comes to talking about trans people, uh, it seems an awful lot of people seize on those outliers because the truth of the matter is there's horrible people from all walks of life. You know, there are horrible trans people out there that will do horrible things. So why is it that it's only them that people are using examples when actually the vast majority of people are just trying to use the bathroom in peace, to be perfectly honest? (laughs) Uh, We have another question. Uh, Somebody uh, wrote that uh, you have made an excellent case for uh, diversity being good for business. Uh, You've uh, given some uh, indicators, some studies about that. Could you speak a little bit more about how diversity impacts the work of scientists? Uh, Is it a benefit? And if it is, how is it a benefit for science? Yeah, so in science, what we really want are people that can look at, you know, solving problems from different angles, think about them in different ways. And yet so often what we see is that people are promoted or people are recruited within groups that are are, are like them. And so what that means is that rather than looking at new and fresh ideas and being willing to sort of look at things in different ways, we're just promoting people that are going to think in the exact same way that we think. And that's not good for um, diversity of thought. It's not good for looking at things in fresh ways. So there's there's something to be said for having people from different backgrounds and maybe they'll get it wrong but at least they will have a different way of looking at it and who knows it can be that incorrect statement which actually leads someone else if you have a conversation to go no that's not true but what about this i know that my best scientific work has all been with collaborations Um, I have very much an engineering approach and the best work I've done has been with I've worked with physicists and chemists who look at things completely different. They know the rules and say, no, you can't do this, but we can do this. And it's not just that diversity of thought with subjects. It's also from backgrounds, different experiences. Um, And also it means that we're widening the pool of people that we have as scientists that we have available to us. The more people feel that they can have a career, in science, then we really can choose the best people. The best people can rise to the top. But if we're already losing people further down the line, um, um, well, yeah, I mean, we're just losing people all along the way. So uh, let's just make sure we we open it up as much as we can, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we have another question. Uh, it says, Early career researchers in academia often witness a lot of casual transphobia, homophobia, racism at their workplace. But because they are on a precarious contract, uh, they cannot always call out this kind of behavior of their seniors. What advice would you, would you give to an early career researcher or scientist who might be in such a position? 
Yeah, this is a really difficult one. Um, and it's not the first time today that the same thing has been said because you are, you're worried. Um, there are groups where I've had people come to me and say there's been this blatant racism come on, but they're the people that are going to write my references. So I can't call that out. Um, and this is where we sort of lack trust in our institutions. We lack trust in our um, harassment procedures, for example. Um, and actually, my TEDx talk was on trust in institutions because we don't feel that we can raise these issues. We don't feel that we will be protected from uh, repercussions. Um, there is such a big, massive power dynamic at different levels. And so it's really difficult for early career researchers to take that power. One thing that you can do is form networks. Twitter can be a horrible, horrible place, but it can also be a fantastic place as well because you can meet fantastic groups of people around the country or in different countries who are all working to the same thing. And it's really powerful to be able to talk to someone and say, does this sound right? How would you report this? What would happen in your institute if this happened? And so there's something to be said for being able to talk to people and support people. And, you know, for those people who happen to be in a horrible group, maybe, and let's be honest, it happens. They know, they'll they think that maybe all groups are like that, but there could be someone in that network that says, no, actually our group is really good. And so it's sometimes it can help to know that there are other good groups. And also um, it can help um, just to be able to sort of speak to people and say, does anyone know this group? What's this group like? What's the track record of this academic? Um, and so there's something powerful to be said for that. But we also need to make sure that we're lobbying our... Um, I, th I, f I, f I feel like I sort of come down hard on universities, but I also realise that their hands are tied in many ways. I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the government can sort of have a hand in certain things that mean that the universities can't do some things. Um, so, you know, let's lobby our learning societies. Let's lobby our funding bodies. The reason that there are certain academics who... Um, have certain characteristics are still employed is because they're bringing in so much money and so they become untouchable within a university environment just because of the money they bring in well if uh, funding bodies had edi requirements and said well you can only have this funding for this machine or this fellowship if you've shown a commitment to edi in some way and a real commitment to edi um, then that will change that will change who gets the money. And so it will change the relationship within the universities and the academics. It'll take a lot of the power away from those academics. So um, we've got to be careful how we do it as well. Um, so I think it was the Wellcome Trust, and I could be wrong on that, that took a grant away from um, a group a couple of years ago. Uh, but I, you know, in that case, uh, it was highlighted to me. We've got to worry about, well, what about the PhD students that you know were signed on for that what about how much how many other people does that affect because it doesn't just affect the group leader so we've got to go about this right and it isn't necessarily about just you know firing people we don't want people to not have jobs but we've got to think about it a little bit more but if these groups don't get the money in the first place um then that might help <laughs> redistribute the equity <laughs> yeah uh, so for uh, anyone who wants to send in questions, the chat room, uh, the chat feature is open. You can just type in your message, any comments, if you want to have a discussion, uh, we can also put you in the mic. And uh, another question that we have is uh, about your personal experience. Uh, you spoke a little bit uh, about how for 15 years, uh, you did not see any out trans person and a few um, LGBT uh, LGB uh, people in science. Uh, have you noticed any patterns and changes in visibility? Has it decreased or increased or remained stable in the last uh, few years? And uh, do you have any ideas of how it might change in the UK at least over the upcoming years? So there's definitely, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, there's definitely increased visibility. But, you know, it's uh, just at the end of last year, I had someone say I was the first trans person they saw speak uh, at a school event I did recently on STEM outreach. 
I say recently, it was when we could actually do that. So it's a year ago, but uh, I had someone say I was the first visibly LGBT person that they'd seen as a teacher doing STEM outreach. But there is an increase. There are more visible role models and uh, being able to come through from with sort of Twitter and things like that, we can certainly connect. And it's great to have this global network. As much as um, COVID sucks, not being able to see people in person, it has opened up the doors. There were people uh, in an event I did for the Royal Society of Chemistry in December who were uh, joined in in a country where it was illegal to be LGBT. And so they'd never seen anyone uh, talk who was LGBT before, but they came to a chemistry event and they happened to see me. So there's something to be said for that. Um, which is why we do have to defend our internet and make sure it maintains and stays neutral. So there, there are more, um, there are more role models, and we are improving in that regard. One thing that's sad, and it's true of other characteristics as well, is that we can't go back through the history books and pull out people from history, um, because if someone was uh, gay or bi or trans and they weren't out. We don't know. We can speculate, but we shouldn't be doing that with our historical figures. So we can't go through the history books. We might be able to find those couple of women that made amazing uh, advances in science um, and remembering that, you know, they weren't actually women weren't allowed to study science for a very long time. Uh, so but we can go back and we can find a few of those uh, figures. But it's really difficult for things like neurodivergent people, people with hidden disabilities, uh, LGBTI plus people. You know, sometimes the only people we hear about are tragic stories. Um, Alan Turing, I think we all know about, was fantastic. He was doing great work. And then um, it was he was outed as being gay. And pretty soon afterwards, he took his own life. Um, and he was still in his career. He was still young. He was still working. We don't know what else he could have found um there's a trans um neuroscientist called ben barras who died a couple of years ago but in his autobiography he talked about how he you know considered taking his own life and he went on to make some fantastic discoveries which contributed to neuroscience i don't pretend to know about the details of his work it's not uh, something called gaia or glia um it's not my field but you know we almost lost that voice and so I think that's why we're seeing it's important to have our modern role models as well as our historical role models, because we can't always go back through the history books. I often hear when it comes to science, you know, there are some people who say, well, men have mo made most of the big scientific discoveries. But as I just said, well, yeah, because we weren't allowing allowing women to do science. They were only allowed to enroll at Oxford University 100 years ago this year. So we push people out there, you know, of course men made discoveries if they were the only ones doing it, that's not a surprise. So uh, we need to think about that a little bit more. <laughs> that's, that's certainly true. We have another question in the chat uh, from Annabelle, she, her. Um, Annabelle says, thank you for this great talk. What is your take on research that is being produced on trans issues by academics, which could be considered hostile, uh, to these issues, uh, who are still in important positions in academia, especially in the social sciences. So this is kind of a question about uh, not only the political discourse, but a lot of discourse within academia uh, being done in a way which is, uh, which feels attacking, which feels uh, diminishing for uh, trans people, and I'm, I'm assuming also other people in other minority status. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I think I think the only way that you you know you're really in trouble is if you um, are op you know if you say something that's explicitly racist or homophobic or transphobic. It's almost like you'll only get in trouble if you tick uh, uh, one of a list of ten words, for instance. And actually, most of the time, the people what I see is that you'll have people who will accidentally say something racist or homophobic. But their meaning is good. They just don't realize the connotations and don't realize. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't be held to account for that. But often it's, you know, the accidental, uh, they're trying, they're, they're listening, they're trying to talk about these things. Um, and their intent isn't to be racist. It's just they're accidentally racist or transphobic. 
Uh, but what we see with a lot of people who truly, you know, there's a lot of real racist and transphobic and homophobic language out there, but they're very good. They know that they are, and therefore they're very good at using words which aren't on the banned list sort of thing. They're very good at talking around it. And I think we need to be able to um, look at context a little bit more. I think that that's something that we miss when we're talking about free speech or hate speech is the context of the comments. What is it they're trying to achieve? What is it that they're trying to do? Um, I also sort of strongly question the intent of people. So I'm a scientist. I'm a material scientist. People could come to me as a scientist and say, okay, what are your views on vaccines? And it could be that I'm an anti-vaxxer and it could be that I say, oh, vaccines are bad. They cause autism. And I can pull out a few papers to prove that vaccines will cause autism and that we need to be looking at va uh, vaccines in a lot more uh in, in a lot more thoroughly i should point out i'm getting my covid vaccine tomorrow so i'm not an anti-vaxxer but uh, i as a scientist could be approached and i could find some scientific evidence to prove my case to prove what i want it's the outline data and because it's out loud outline data i can say well you know yeah they're ahead of their time but that wouldn't be that wouldn't have any academic integrity that wouldn't hold any merit if i look at you know that I wouldn't put myself in that position. I wouldn't talk about that because of the ethical implications. I know that I am not an expert on biomedicine. I know that I'm not an expert on, um, on vaccines. So why would I be talking about vaccines? And what we see with the trans argument often or the trans debate is that you see people from fields. So we have... Um, a fairly wide consensus in the medical field sort of from an awful lot of different countries who say that there are certain methods that these are the best ones sure we need to fund them better but what they're saying is that this is the best uh, path of care for people in the UK at the moment this is the best knowledge we have um, and the medical medical society are always looking at this they're always balancing they're more cautious than not and they're going to change their minds if they find significant evidence to the opposite. So we've got these medical experts, and yet we have other people in different fields. Maybe they're in political science or history or social sciences who are looking at data and saying that they know better than the medical experts. And as I said with vaccines, I wouldn't uh, give opinions on uh, vaccines because that's not my area of expertise and I have to wonder about you know I have to wonder why um, these people who are not in the field who are not medical or in uh, counseling why they are being given so much of a platform where they're being listened to so much um, it's it, it concerns me and I don't think it's necessarily the right path um, and I do think that we need to have a bit more integrity with who we listen to when we hear people talking about these things. Another question that we have is, uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, the barriers for people who want to enter STEM sciences. One of them uh, is uh, just not uh, having visibility. Another one is harassment uh, of uh, individuals. And you've also spoken a little bit about uh, uh, the kind of like ideas that people have that uh, you know physics is just being created by men, for instance. Uh, could you pinpoint uh, specifically uh, some other beliefs or ideas or hurdles that we have within UK universities in the STEM field, uh, which prevent people from minority backgrounds, uh, LGBTQI or BAME or women as well, from entering the field, uh, so other than harassment and lack of visibility? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, um, we definitely see people who every so often will advocate for eugenics research, excuse me, which is that, you know, uh, uh, men are better than women or that certain races are intellectually superior to others. and we still see these sort of discussions come up on a semi-regular basis. It's we're not eradicated. We are not past racism or any of these sort of things in our UK institutions. Um, 
So, so there's definitely that. I think one of the most relevant discussions at the moment is um, in certain fields in uh, STEM, we have people who um, are suggest are calling into question the integrity of researchers from particularly China. Uh, there have been some very open um, papers that are discussing the integrity and quality of the data from uh, Chinese research groups. And so, uh, and, and people calling that into question. And, and, and so, you know, it's, we're seeing these in different ways. And again, maybe the, the specific language that's being used isn't racist, but, you know, the intent or the way it's being called into question is. Uh, so that's definitely one thing that I see. Um, I realize I work in labs where big engineering equipment, big equipment, I mean, not the most accessible whatsoever, um, but we need to figure out how to make it more accessible, more welcoming, because, yeah, using experimental data is is important for people. And I know a physicist who is basically always, um, you know, they're brilliant. They've got a brilliant mind. And they're always pushed out of working with the experimental side because of their physical uh, limitations and are confined to data processing. So at the moment, they basically say that I'm not doing science. I'm just doing I'm just crunching numbers and that's all anyone will let me do. And so there are different examples of things that we do, how we make machine. I mean, you know, the machines I work with. Yeah, they're really difficult. I don't know how I can make them more accessible. But if someone you know, but we need to, we need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about what we can do. There are going to be limitations. We know that, but maybe there's different ways around it. Uh, and so I'm really lucky to be able to talk to researchers who have different perspectives and different backgrounds to hear about this. I've been called out on things in the past for using language that I didn't realize or not thinking about things in different ways. And I think, I think we should, as academics, we should welcome you know, we should welcome learning. I think we should welcome it. We shouldn't be defensive. We shouldn't uh, be worried that, you know, we shouldn't be worried about looking bad because we said the wrong thing. We should be welcoming the fact that we've given, we're given an opportunity to learn and improve. If we weren't here to learn and to move forward and to grow, then science would be over. We'd know everything. So if we want to learn more when it comes to science, then why wouldn't we want to do that when it comes to other people's experiences? Um, you know, I'm just one. I, I don't even represent all white trans women. You know, I, I'm just one voice and I have my experience. Uh, and so we should want to hear those experiences and learn from them, just like we do with our science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like bringing as many different voices into the process of science. Yeah. Uh, you've spoken a little bit uh, about uh, your experience when you uh, came to Oxford uh, with the interview, job interview, and the whole process. And uh, I'm very happy to hear that uh, it it's, was an overall positive experience. Uh, I'm also wondering, uh, have you heard from other people uh, that you know, other uh, trans people, LGBTQI people, in the sciences, uh, in uh, different universities, and uh, do they have similar experiences um, with their process as well uh, of employment? Some. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, you tend to hear more the negative experiences and the negative stories, and they happen in institutions around the UK. There's no question that they do. Um, and it tends to be those stories that I hear about. There are some people who seem to be doing really well and you see them and they're sort of pretty visible. Uh, but if you talk to them, <laughs> it's not necessarily been so easy. Uh, there's a couple of people I can talk, you know, call to mind now. I'm not going to name them, but, you know, you look at them and you think, wow, look at the position they're in, look at the work they're doing. And I talk to them behind the scenes and they've had to fight all along the way they've had to fight um, and so many people like I say have been pushed out by that sort of behavior so sadly I'd say that we've got more negative than positive stories in that regard but I am positive about the number of say LGBTI plus people I see in sciences now it's not as small a field as it used to be the conferences are growing the support on, and the groups on Twitter are growing so 
there are there are a growing body but it's not necessarily it's not all the way i think it's definitely coming from the top this improved visibility and diversity is is uh, you know it'll rise up but i'm not sure it's really there yet i often get asked like oh do you know a a uh, trans person in this particular field, preferably someone who's a uh, uh, BIPOC. And I'm like, wow, I don't even know a trans person in that field. Never mind. You know, there, there tends to be a small field um, of, well, there tends to be a small number of sort of very vocal trans activists in STEM, um, especially as it paints such a large target on your back. And if you also include intersectionality, that becomes a bigger target. So, um, people don't feel safe enough to be in that position yet, but uh, we're seeing more people coming in, like safe from the bottom. And so it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And I would say that even at the top, there's a genuine desire to improve things and make things better. Um, I honestly do believe that people all the way up, people do want to make it, make things better, make things more equitable, make place where people can just get on with their science. And so, that's a really positive story um, and I'm really glad to see that. So there will be more of those positive stories as we go along. <laughs> I, I really hope so. Uh, so if anyone else uh, has a question, please uh, send it uh, in the chat uh, and we would love to uh, highlight it. Uh, another question that uh, I was thinking about is related to uh, kind of the scientific method and the types of topics that are chosen uh, in science and does that does the type of people who enter uh, different departments does that impact the types of topics that are brought up and the, the, the process of uh, the method uh, the way things are being done do you think that shifts with uh, increasing diversity and viewpoints or uh, that is a separate thing the scientific method is not uh, impacted by that um, I'm not sure so much about the scientific method per se. Definitely different fields are, are um, show different statistics when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So, you know, we talk about uh, the binary genders. Some fields have a lot higher percentage of uh, women than um, other fields. Same with LGBTI plus inclusion. Uh, certain fields are, um, there's less openness in certain fields so um and and actually you know you do hear that particular fields within certain subjects you know i hear um certain things about particular different top uh, areas within say chemistry or uh, other fields so i think there are some uh some subjects are more open than others and i think that within that some fields are more open than others i would say that um, material science, all the material science groups I've been in have always been um, more diverse than other groups I've seen around them in terms of the binary genders um, for groups that have been in engineering or, or uh, chemistry groups. Um, we've always had this sort of, I've always been in groups that have had a 50-50 binary gender ratio. Um, they've always been quite international. I realize that maybe not. Um, so uh, racially diverse from British point of view, um, but they have been sort of fairly international groups as well. So I think I'm kind of lucky that I'm in material science and I've had bad groups and I've worked with bad people and I've had discrimination, but generally I've always found materials to be a pretty good field to be in. So um, I'm just, and I literally came to materials by, you know, by fluke. So uh, I'm really lucky in that regard. <laughs> That's, that's excellent. Uh, we don't seem to have uh, other questions coming in, so we might uh, wrap it up in a bit. Uh, before we do that, uh, I just wanted to ask you, is there something, uh, that some advice that you would uh, give to uh, graduate students or undergraduates uh, from different minority groups, not just LGBTI, but also others, uh, on how to deal with the struggles that we've highlighted, uh, specifically harassment and lack of visibility and all of these different prejudices, in, including you know, the debates uh, around these issues, which can feel very alienating to people. So you've dealt with a lot of that. What advice do you have from your own personal 
life that can help other people cope with all of these struggles? So one thing that's really important is that um, you don't get weighed down by the negative. So it's there's always something that can be fixed. There's always something that can be improved. You can always go forward. Um, and we should never be sort of complacent and stay where we are. But don't get weighed down by the negatives, by the what might seem like losses. Because even if you campaign to improve one thing, it might not take effect then, it might not take effect next time, but it will, it will help. And whenever you get a win, maybe, you know, whatever that is, um, you've got to remember to really look at those wins. I know for me, I say that when I go into schools and I'm doing science outreach, you know, it might be that I've got uh, 50 young people in the audience and most of them are bored when I'm talking about superconductors and aren't really interested. They just wanted to get out of the classroom for a bit. But they're, but and a lot of people will say, well, that's, you know, a loss. But no, there'll be one young person in that audience who maybe all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, this is what material science is. Oh, this is what superconductors are. And it isn't a loss if you only get through to one person out of a thousand. To me, that's a win. They're the person that needed to hear it. They're the person that needed to see you. They needed to see that um, black speaker. They needed to see that uh, woman engineer. They needed to see an LGBT person. It's those wins. we And I think we forget about those, but actually um, we shouldn't be pushing them down. We should actually be celebrating them a lot more and hold on to them because there can be a lot of pushbacks, but those positives can really, but they really have an impact. And so, uh, yeah, just hold on to the positive. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And I think uh, what you're doing with your volunteer work, with your activism and your science is one of the positives. Uh, and we have, unfortunately, uh, so few role models uh, who are doing that. So thanks for being a trailblazer and thanks for coming to Wilson uh, to join us for our LGBTQI History Month. It was a pleasure and we really hope to have you uh, come visit us again very soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, I look forward to uh, being able to come in person at some point. <laughs> Love that. Take care. Take care. Bye. to see everyone. <laughs> Don't know where anything is now.